Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. I'm not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on you know it it's particularly skillful when a writer can do uh, kind of a hat trick, you know, when they can, um, one, set their story, set their fiction in a historical context and have all those juicy details. And then they make it work in that historical context. They actually make it where the mystery works or when the, you know, the, the big, the big plot action actually works in that context. And then thirdly, when they can actually humanize history, because a lot of people think history is kind of boring. A lot of people are wrong, by the way, but to disabuse them of that notion, it's good that we have wonderful authors like N.L. Holmes, who is back. We just spoke with her right after the beginning of the first season, uh, first season of the, of the seventh season. She kicked off her seventh season in January, and we're so thrilled uh, to have N.L. Holmes back on Mysterious Goings On. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, you've been busy. Yep. <laughs> no grass grows beneath these feet. <laughs> And folks, I'll tell you what, we had a great conversation and you look in the show notes, you can get uh, the link to that conversation and you can learn all about one of her, uh, we're going to talk about a new book and one of her series, she has two series, and we kind of focus more on that series for that interview, but we also get into a lot of her backstory and history and things like that. So today's kind of an update because, as she said, no grass uh, growing beneath her feet. And she has just released a new book, and I am excited about this one. Um, it's so new, it's not even on her website yet, but it's part of, uh, she's got two series. One is the Lord Haunting Mysteries, but this one, this was part of your other series, the Empire, Empire at Twilight series, which, oh my gosh, this one is so well-reviewed, by the way, folks, this new book. you got to go to Goodreads and see these wonderful reviews that I just am just envious of as a writer. They're wonderful. Um so tell us about this series first, if you don't mind, and then the, we can just talk about the new book. Sure. Well, the series uh, takes place in the Hittite Empire in the last three generations before it falls. So that puts it in the 13th century BCE, uh, a period called the Bronze Age. Uh, no, hardly anyone's heard of the Hittites here because, well, it was only discovered about 100 years ago. But it was a very powerful place in its day. They were comparable to Egypt, and they were sometimes friends and sometimes enemies, but but peers. And so I, you know, we know relatively little about them, but we know some events and, and a few names. And so I took, as I always do, in each book, took an event and uh, let us see it through the eyes of a particular person, either an active protagonist or just someone sort of watching from the wings. Uh, this particular book, the new book, Sun at Twilight, is actually taking um, the story of an emperor, the uh, Tuthalia IV, who comes to the throne in the 1230s, 
and um, it, it's a few events that took place early in his reign, which seem to have dramatic possibilities. Well, yeah, because if we're looking at the series, you have um, the lightning horse, which is told through the eyes of a, a charioteer, right? right. Mm -hmm. And then you have the singer and her song, which uh, uh, that's uh, based through from the eyes of a singer, <laughs> of, of a singer. Yeah, and and, and I, I assume you hear her song. And then the third, the third one is the queen's dog, which is through the eyes uh, of whom? A uh, a eunuch slave. Okay, for a minute there, I thought you were going to say, "Well, of course, the dog, Alex." <laughs> well, dog in the in the old uh, Near Eastern sense of something lower than low, yeah. Yeah, a eunuch slave. My gosh, um, fantastic stuff. So I I love this, and and uh, the reason I mentioned some of the reviews is because people. Can I embarrass you and just read a review real quick that somebody wrote? Don't worry, it's a good one. I'm, What's oh, I'm sorry, Mr. What? If it's a good one, I have no shame. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Goodreads, and I love to look at Goodreads because Goodreads is full of people who actually love books and actually read and appreciate them. You rarely get a stinker on Goodreads. Anyway, people on Goodreads, it's been my experience at least, they just won't write anything at all if they don't like it, usually. There's a few, but, you know. Um, I don't want to see this. Okay, this is the one. This is from someone named Tasha Treadway. She said, The Sun at Twilight by N.L. Holmes. I have absolutely loved this series, which shocks me because this is not my favorite genre. I have loved every book a little more than the one before. This one was just as amazing as the others. Um, and she goes on to say, but, but what I, it's, and she's got a, it's a deeper review, but the point is, I, I always love it when um, a reader says, I didn't think I would like it, but then you just totally blew me away. And that seems to be a common thread in the reviews I'm reading. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel happy because when I set out to write these books set in old and obscure periods, I didn't know how many people out there would, would be interested. I tried to make the story interesting, but sometimes people don't get in, get past the, you know, the blurb. But I find that just ordinary readers like them too, in many cases at least. So that, uh, that makes me feel like I'm getting my message through. You know, one thing that uh, we did touch on in our initial interview about you as your background is you, this is your, your life story could easily be a great book is a nun turned archaeologist. Um, just if you could, just for the people who may be just meeting you for the first time, maybe we could just briefly touch on just a kind of the, the quick version of, of that and that, that path for you and then how that is informed how you write and tell stories. Uh, well, I guess the common thread here is a, a, a love of living in the past. <laughs> uh, uh, in 1970, I entered the Discalced Carmelites. I stayed there for nearly 20 years. And the minute I came out, I headed back to school to get a, a BA in classical studies. And then I went on for uh, graduate degrees in, in near, classical and Near Eastern archaeology at Bryn Mawr College. And so since then, I've been teaching in one capacity or another with occasional years off to do other things. And it was not until I retired from teaching that I seriously began writing novels um, with the same sort of mission that I felt I'd had as a teacher. And that is to bring the past to life and show its human side. Was there... Uh... Was there something about the um, Hittite culture that, that as you uh, just uh, told us, has really only been known for about a century? Um, was there something about it, though, that jumped out at you? Or was it simply because, I, I mean, what would jump out at me, but I, this is, I'm not you, obviously, is that I don't think anybody's written mystery series in the Hittites. Probably not. <laughs> but what, what, what about that that just made you go, okay, this is it. This is where I'm going to go. Well, for one thing, I, having taught a class in ancient empires, I I knew of a a number of events in their history that had dramatic possibilities. But also I found them very appealing because they were quite humane compared to the the societies around them. There was hardly anything that had a capital punishment. They were very sexually liberated. So they seemed like congenial folks and um hmm. I was I was eager to learn more about them myself. I like that. Well, in the sun at twilight, the blurb here is, you know, uh, as you're saying, you mentioned this, but it's the twilight years, so the Hittite Empire. Um, 
and this, and I can't pronounce this new leader. I'm sorry. Pronounce it, please. Alia. Okay. Dude, that Alia. One. Mm -hmm. to um yeah. comes to the throne as a usurper his younger son determined to rule according to the traditional values of justice and clemency despite the harder advice of his ambitious mother and his questionably loyal older brothers um then we get into some some treachery and some things happening here um i'm curious this is probably a ridiculous question but you've probably know me well enough to know i'm not afraid to ask anyway so uh what do you think if um, if uh, let's just say that the, these kind of char these characters, if, you know, based on real real folks, if they could get in a time machine, come up here, and then in their language present them a novel, what do you think they would say to you about how their culture and how they are presented? Do you have any? Have you ever thought about it that way? What would they do if I could actually meet them? What would they say? They would be completely. <laughs> amused i think at uh how imaginative the spin was <laughs> because of course we know nothing about these people as individuals we may know a few of their actions but the novelist has to look at an action and say what sort of person would do that and it could be any sort of person in fact yeah i i'm always just I just always think about that myself. I've not really written any period stuff or anything uh, of this manner, but uh, it's something I'm, I'm going to try to rem remember to ask myself, you know, if I'd ever do. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a fanciful question, I know, but I like to think about it. Uh, I've often way. thought um, about how, what the characters would be doing if they lived in our period, how they would look and um, what careers they would have chosen and stuff. So yeah, it's fun to kind of bring them up, up to the now. Now, there you go, right there. Now, is how, okay, you just opened a can of worms here. How about this? Would, if we, just to help people think about this a little bit, if they're thinking about reading this, is there anybody in modern day or, or recent memory that is analogous to your lead character in this story? Oh, that's a good, good question. I, I would say some poor sod that's caught in a, a position of uh, unwanted power. Uh, I, this is something that struck me reading history a lot, that if you're a conscientious person, being a king is a terrible burden. And especially in those days, they, they were so hands-on. They had to be the warlord and the high priest and the administrator and the judge. So unless you were really into that sort of thing, it must have been deadly. Um, I don't know, maybe Edward VIII who didn't stick with it very long, <laughs> but uh, he made us understand how, how burdensome it could be. Yeah. I was actually just thinking about him. I was going to throw that out, you know, and they say he threw it all away for Wallace Simpson, but come on. Part of it may very well have been, I just don't want to do this life. This is not for me. I certainly get that. Yeah. I, um, I, uh, I, I have found that, um, there, when I think about, um, that kind of thing. I think about Marcus Aurelius a little bit, and I, I know this is not Hittite, obviously. This is far later than this, but in the Roman era. But but uh, Stoicism is something that I'm really delving into these days. And um, he, he was kind of, I think, exceptional in that he had power and wielded it thoughtfully more so than probably, I mean, you could probably count, in my opinion, just my opinion, and I, had, I am not by no means as educated as you are on this, but in my opinion, he probably wielded power more thoughtfully uh, and humanely than, than most people who ever had such power. W would you think that's a fair, fair thing, or am I, am I making a bad assumption? No, I, I think you're right, and perhaps he was one of the relatively few people who craved power. He just found himself in that position. And then being a philosopher, he uh, he tried to wield it for the good of, of the people. But clearly it affects different people in different ways. A history is full of those who adore power and can't get enough of it, abuse it or not, but uh, enjoy their role. You know, uh, when I think of where the United States is today, if we can just take a quick aside here, I I think it's it's not by any means too precious to see an analogy between maybe if not the last days of Rome certainly when Rome started to devolve further and further into an authoritarianism and uh, I just wonder um, if that whole um, power as a drug you know if, if it's just something that there's just too few humans 
who can resist it. For example, if you, and I don't mean to pick on anybody's politics, but just assume, you know, you're, you're the Senate minority leader now, but former Senate majority leader who to me seems like just, if I was going to write a book about somebody who absolutely wanted power for power's sake, it would be uh, our friend from Kentucky. Well, I, I think it, it's not true in every case, of course, but often it's people who feel a little insecure about themselves, I think, who uh, get off on power like that. The idea of being able to to wield something over others. It's hard to know. I'm not a psychiatrist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting. So I think writers listening, play, pay attention to these dynamics we're seeing in our own capital, I think, especially if you're going to write something uh, along those lines. But let's get back to uh, The Sun at Twilight. Um, so this is the fourth in this series. Give us a little uh, behind the scenes here. You started this series when? Uh, I guess that must have been around 2001 or two. That's The Lightning Horse was the first of this series. And in fact, Tudhalia and his mother, uh, Puto Hepa, a, a very flamboyant real historical personage, were in the, uh, the, the Lightning Horse as well. If anyone's read that, uh, Tudhalia was the little boy. But now he's a grown man. Uh, and then, I don't know, some, I, I read, uh, wrote these first, mostly, and then I switched away to the Egyptian series and sort of now I've got two or three underway in both series, and so I cut back and forth between them so I don't lose my eye for the for the other culture. You ever find yourself writing a sentence that was clearly for Lord Hani and not for this one? It could happen any day. <laughs> hey, let's give the, the Cliff notes on the Lord Hani real quick. Could you, do you mind sharing about that real quickly? Just tell the, the folks who maybe haven't yet heard the previous interview. Uh, a series of cozy mysteries set in the uh, Egypt of Akhenaten, which is to say the, the 14th century BC. And it's about a, a real person, a diplomat by the name of Hani. Uh, we have references uh, to him and his missions in the Amarna letters, which is a set of um, political documents that we have found in Egypt. And because we seem to know kind of a lot about him and yet nothing about him as a person, it seemed like a, a cool place to start. So he's the, he's the protagonist. His um, secretary, a, a dwarf, who then becomes his son-in-law, and his father's another um, rather predominant character, and increasingly his daughter, <clears throat> who is um, a sunet or a physician uh, for the the royal women. She's sort of taking on a life of her own. I may have to do a series for her later. But uh, each of these books has a, an internal arc, like a sort of mystery du jour. But in addition, there's quite a lot of uh, arc from one to another, character development, things like that. For example, the children get older. Um, Hani's friend Thomas figures more and more in it as time goes by. So you can read them individually, but uh, it might be more fun or you, or you get the full effect if you start at the beginning and and go through in, in order, I think. Well, you've said previously that uh, there's some powerful elements that run through these books and, you know, mysterious political assassinations, uh, shocking affairs uh, with heads of state, dramatic family maneuverings, plots for rebellion and resistance. I mean, this has got it all. Well, times never change. I mean, if, if that's good for a story in the 20th century, it's good for a story in the 14th BC. So you said you've got books in the works for both series. Is this primarily where you're going to hang out for the next few years with your writing? Probably. Uh, I'm about to push Lord Hani into his uh, his old age, and so I think I'll go back to do some prequels uh, after this and maybe do a series with his daughter as the protagonist, sort of continuing his story. Um, the other one, I just want to take it sh a brief ways further, because the uh, the Hittite Empire is going to fall in the early 12th century, which doesn't leave us many years. Uh, actually, Tutalia's two sons were the, the final emperors. So, so I'd like to see the empire out and then maybe or maybe not uh, plug in a few in earlier periods. Um, so what became of the empire? Uh, did, who conquered them or what happened? 
Well, there was this mysterious phenomenon at the end of the Bronze Age uh, that we haltingly called the invasion of the Sea Peoples. It wasn't exactly an invasion. It was a complete social upheaval. And we think it was a result of famine and earthquakes and political revolution all around the Aegean, including the Greeks and the, the people of the Hittite Empire uh, were dissatisfied. They rose up violently and, and more important, they began to uh, seek refuge elsewhere. So you get this enormous movement of whole peoples around the coast of the East Mediterranean. It brought down uh, the city of Ugarit and a lot of those big maritime kingdoms there brought down the Hittites. They even tried to do it, cross the border into Egypt. This is a familiar thing. But yeah. um, while they didn't conquer Egypt or break it down, they weakened it permanently, and it would never be the power that it had been. It's People are missing out so much, I think, on history. There's just so much. History is cool. What can I say? <laughs> before, you, uh, when, before you became... Uh... Uh, before you took your vows, before you became a nun, did you was history really important to you in your life? Oh yes, I from childhood I was fascinated with um, the old, and I, I couldn't tell you exactly why, what sort of psychological itch that scratched. But I know that when I was a small kid and saw historical sword and sandal movies like The Egyptian or something, that somehow that triggered something in me, and I got all excited about it then, and um. Just from then on, I wrote, wrote, read all the history books I could find, and my, I kind of veered around. The 16th century Spain was my thing for a while. Almost mm. any period, I just, I just loved any period of history. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, and of course, I'm dig going to start digging into your. I told you this in January when we spoke that now I've got to stack new a new but a new series on my nightstand but and you're you're in there and uh but you know the series that i fell in love with years ago and it's funny for a guy from a boy from oklahoma who didn't even see the ocean until he was 23 but the 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 whole well for one of a shorthand the master and commander series the just fell in love with the sea and and those stories because you had adventure and it's all i think now you you might tell me it's different but it's seemingly it's very seamless with the history and they seem to pay a lot of it. Patrick, uh, oh shoot, I'm blanking on his last name, but he, the author, he was so meticulous, I think, about how he described life at sea and then the machinations and politics with the Admiralty. Did, are you, have you read those or any of those? I love them. And, you know, when I was a small kid, I used to read the Horatio Hornblower stories, which are set in the same period. And like you, right. I, I grew up 600 miles from the sea. So this was my vicarious way of sailing, I guess. Yeah, they're they're fantastic books, and so I have tremendous respect for that. And uh, it's funny, I was just I, I was teasing that you're coming back, by the way, on Twitter. Uh, and uh, a read a listener said, "Oh, thanks for reminding me. I got to buy her series." So they, she went and bought your series. And uh, I I think that the word is going to keep getting out. I think you're doing. It's obviously the series is doing really well, and uh, I'm excited for you. Uh, last question as we wrap you up here, unless you've got something. Of course, if I miss something, you can you can tell me. But. Um, I think these now budget might be a problem, but I think these seem to. Uh, I think that these could be a great uh, Netflix series. What do you oh, think? Oh, I, I I can see especially the Lord Hani series very easily on on television. Well made, you know. Maybe the Brits will do it. <laughs> the problem will be, as you point out, the production values would seem to be very expensive, and maybe you could do it all with CGI. I don't know, but I'd love to well, see it. Well, uh, Star Wars fans will know that the Mandalorian is ninety percent done in front of a green screen. You know well, that that can be done, then. And it looks good. I mean, you know, of course it's it's a fictional, futuristic world that doesn't actually exist, so it might be a little different. But yeah, to that point. Well, anything I've missed while we're catching up? I've so enjoyed catching up with you. Well, I've enjoyed it too. I I can't think of anything. Okay, great. Well, how do we find out more about you? The link will be in the show notes. But go ahead and let us know where where do we go. Uh, my website is www.nlholmes, as in Sherlock, <laughs> dot com. Oh, it's fantastic. Folks, go there and check it out. And uh, so you'll find the link in the show notes. There's Here's what you're going to find in those show notes. You're going to find a link. Now, 
seriously, if you haven't listened, if you've got these back to front, go back, click on the link and listen to the first episode where we meet uh, our wonderful guest. Listen to that one. But there'll be links there to her website. There will also be links where you can go buy the books. And I would like everybody to who listened to this show and bought the books and if you reviewed them which I encourage you to do I would very much appreciate if you screenshot that review and sent it to me and I will read it on a future episode of the show I just think it's important that um, we support our authors and give them good reviews I as an author know how much one good review can mean to a book and to a series and um, you know I got into a tussle I'm just gonna tell you this real quick I got into a tussle on Twitter which I swore I would stop doing, but somebody, I'm just going to tell you, and I, I think you're so genteel and kind, you're not going to say anything other than, oh, well, how interesting, but here's what happened. So so somebody said a question on Twitter, just one of those open questions, uh, what's something that's too expensive? So of course I replied, free advice, but that's like not it. what I, thank you. Well, then somebody <laughs> said books, somebody said books. She said, look at this. And she had a picture said $12.99 for a paperback. That's ridiculous. Well, are I, you expecting <laughs> expecting a reaction to that? <laughs> so I well, here's what I said. I said, I, 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 I yeah. What did I say? I just I we got I got apoplectic for some reason. I don't know why. It's just it, it just drove me crazy because this is probably somebody who would spend twelve ninety nine without thinking about it uh, for lunch or a fast food restaurant. Uh, but it just seems like if you think twelve ninety nine seems to me such a cheap ticket to go to an entry to another world that can take you out of the cares of this one and all the hours we as writers put into our books and all that, I don't know. You you're you're above that, I can tell. But I I it just it just made me very cross, I, and no, I just I, said that. I completely understand where you're coming from, and it's true compared to other things. Books are not that expensive. I guess what I'm thinking of is originally when paperbacks came out, it was supposed to be a cheap alternative to hardbacks, and true. they aren't very cheap, comparatively speaking. <laughs> That's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, I, but I I did get a little self-righteous with it, but but I, I think you're right. But I think I, I have this thing I keep saying is I think there's too many people in this country who know the cost of everything but the value of nothing. And uh, that was my high horse for the day. And I just thought of that today. And I, I know I'll cringe when I listen back to this episode going, Alex, why'd you bring that up? But I just, when I speak to fellow writers, I just think about it because I, I know the, we're not talking just, you know, a few minutes to write a book here. We're talking literally hours a day for months on end. Well, it's, it's interesting though. I think things are shifting under our feet. 90% of my book sales are eBooks. And I myself don't even have an e-reader. I mean, I want something in my hand and be able to turn the pages, but I think we're a vanishing breed. I think you're totally right. 90% uh, of mine, although I had a very nice, you know, do you know when I sell paperbacks the most? I sell them around the holidays. Oh, uh, yeah. Because people want to give a book, I sure. think, you know, and they can't just say, I sent you a, a download to your to your Kindle. I think that's a good point, though. But um, well, I, that's good. And I, I'm kind of glad we, we went off on that that uh, because I was curious too to hear that about how what direction it seems to be going. And you're you're basically amplifying what I'm talking to 90% of the writers who I interview. They say it's it's all it's all ebook nowadays, which is a shame to a large degree. Because do you remember? when vinyl kind of went away and then it became CDs and everybody was like, I miss the album covers, you know? And now people are like, I miss the, the book cover and I miss the tactical, the feeling of holding it and turning the pages and smelling it and all that stuff. But uh, I don't think they'll go away completely. Do you? No, no. And, and, you know, of course there's also the trend of, of audio books and I'm, I, I, they don't replace reading in a solitary way to, for, to me, but I think, there's something to be said for them. Uh, one thing you can do it while you're driving or whatever. But the main thing is that that words are meant to be spoken. I mean, the whole idea of storytelling is an oral thing. And right. so if you get a good reader, I think it's a, perhaps you get more insights through a spoken version than you do through seeing the, the words on the page. I, that's a great point. Usually for me, audiobooks are my companion for a long drive or a flight, which of course, the, for, uh, for me the, and, and most people the past year, there's not been any long drives or flights. But uh, um, but I, I do look forward to I, I think I might be going to a conference in August, assuming things are okay and I'm fully vaxxed and all that stuff. And um, I need to probably pack a few. So are you 
Are your books uh, audio yet, or are you thinking about uh, it? One is, and then the second one is, it's been done, and it's just waiting to be uploaded by Audible. So um, they would be the first two uh, novels in the Lord Hani mysteries. That would be Bird in a Snare? Right, and, and the Crocodile the pro Makes No Sound is already out in audio. Oh, and if you're wondering why I did number two before number one, it's because number one has more difficult foreign names, even foreign to the Egyptians. So I wanted to sort of let my reader in gently. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't was is it male or female? No. Okay. Yeah, you don't want him to run him off too fast, you know. <laughs> Oh, man. N.L. Holmes. Again, folks, go to uh, her website and look at all. It's nlholmes.com. It's a beautiful website, and you can see these gorgeous covers for both series. Though, talking about covers, those alone will, will, will encourage you to, to get into these books. And uh, hey, um, yes, as, as I've said before, and as I'm so glad you did today, you're welcome back anytime. Let us know when you've got a new book, and we'll share it with uh, the listeners. Well, thanks very much, Alex. It's always fun. Hi, I am Connor Braden, host of the Story of a Storyteller podcast, author of The Longest Night and General Egypt, and you are listening to Mysterious Goings On. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings, all of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.